Good day and welcome to Birding for Beginners. The bird we're looking at today is the blacksmith plover. It's a common sight around water, like pans and lakes and rivers and dams, and even a small a puddle in your garden, you probably find the blacksmith plover there. It also inhabits the waters, inland waters, but near the sea, but not much salt stuff. They're not particularly interested in the waves and that sort of thing. Blacksmith plovers are noisy and conspicuous birds. They have a characteristic ding, 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 or clung, 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 which which they make from the ground, where they are spend most of their time searching for food, tending to chicks or in flight. This is where the blacksmith plover gets its name from, on that ding, 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 which sounds very metallic, and also sounds like a blacksmith hanger, hammer ringing on an anvil. It's not difficult to recognize the blacksmith plover. Their plumage is boldly marked in black and white and grey. They are unlikely to be mistaken for any other species. They have grey and black wings. The rest of the body and head are patterned in black and white, also the underparts. The females on average are a little bigger than the males, but both sexes look very much alike. They are about 30 centimetres tall. And if you look at episode 6 of Birding for Beginners, you'll see how we divide them into different groups. We have generally four categories of birds. We have very small birds, which are birds that are smaller than a sparrow. We have small birds, which is larger than a sparrow, but smaller than a pigeon. Then we have medium-sized birds, which are birds larger than a pigeon, but smaller than a guinea fowl. Then we have large birds, which are larger than a guinea fowl. A blacksmith plover is bigger than a pigeon, but smaller than a guinea fowl. Therefore, it fits into the medium-sized birds. At about 170 grams, not a very heavy bird, but a fairly big one. The bull is black and typical or for insect eaters. Legs, also black. Eyes, well they're dark red. Not often seen, but they're dark red. The male and female are very much the same in most aspects. Outwardly, the only difference is a little spur on the wing of the male. I've never observed this in real life. But when I have examined some of my photographs, as you'll see, there's a tiny spur in some of the pictures. I therefore assume that those are the males. I wouldn't break my neck over this. It really doesn't make much difference. The juvenile has basic plumage patterns of an adult, but its tones are speckled brown with buff tips to its feathers. And when the light shines through it, it creates quite a beautiful picture. So where do we find these blacksmith plovers? They're endemic to sub-Sahara Africa, occurring from Kenya to through Tanzania, southern DRC, Angola, Zambia, all the way down to South Africa. More on the east coast than on the west coast. And also, of course, through Mozambique. It generally prefers moist, short grass, mud flats around dams and sewage and lakes and pans. We've spoken about that a bit. Road verges, sports fields, airfields, not so good for the aeroplanes, and heavily grazed areas. The blacksmith plover mostly forages or eats when it's on foot, when they run around scanning the area for small little terrestrial invertebrates to eat, or aquatic invertebrates, which includes insects, worms, dragonfly nymph, other insects and their larvae, beetles and ants, mollusks, crustaceans, and occasionally, occasionally some plant material. They do most of the foraging in the early and late in the day, standing still 
when the tent is scanning for its prey. One spotted it dashes forward to pluck the animal on the surface of the ground or the water. It also searches for insects, larva, and dung. Sometimes trembling its foot in shallow water to attract the prey to the surface. It doesn't build an elaborate nest. It normally has shallow depression in the ground, sometimes from the footprint of an animal, like a cow or something like that. It prefers short grass, close to water, and they tend to make their nests about 400 meters apart, or half a kilometer apart. They don't particularly enjoy competition, but that also helps them scan the area for predators. They generally breed in spring, but the choice of nesting sites and timing may be opportunistic. It doesn't only breed in spring, but throughout the year, but that's its major uh, breeding time. It gets into the hollow scrape form in the ground and shuffles around a bit, kicking stones out, bringing stuff in. Nests are typically positioned close to water, where they are lined with grass stalks and little stones and mud flakes. If the ground is wet, the nest is more substantial mound to reduce the risk of, uh, risk of flooding, destroying the eggs. Speaking of eggs, usually three to four and about 40 centimeters by 29. The eggs are a deep greenish, brownish yellow blotched with black and gray spots. And the incubation, incubation period is about a month. 26 to 33 days. They usually are monogamous, one man, one woman. Territorial, they are solitary nest nesters. When incubating the eggs, they sit on the nest for between about 20 to 80 minutes so that they can warn each other for predators. That is, one of the party sits on the eggs for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then the other party goes around and foraging, also is very careful in looking in the sky, watching to see if there are any predators around, or watching the ground to see if there are any um, uh, predators or enemies coming. Now, if it is too hot, they often shade the nest with their bodies, just lifting themselves off a little bit off the ground, and also, they use their bellies to collect some water from the, from the nearby wetlands and use that to cool the eggs. This they call belly wetting the eggs. That cools them in hot days. The chicks are fairly well camouflaged and precocial. Precocial. That means they can almost fend for themselves and get up and run around as soon as they are born. They leave the nest for, uh, within an hour of hatching, after which they remain close to their parents, sort of within about 10 meters. As time goes by, after the chicks have hatched, they generally become more independent and go further and further away from the adults. They become fully independent at about two months of age and they will remain in this family gathering until the next brood is being incubated and move completely away during that time after the next brood is hatched. The adults warn... Hey, you can hear one in the background. The adults warn, warn the young ones when predators approach and through a false brood display. That means they sort of duck down and make as if this is their nest, which actually they're not. They get rid of the predators. They also um, open both wings up and show themselves and rush at their predators, especially the small ones like your mongoose and uh, little critters like that that I think uh, blacksmith eggs are good for dinner. And they have chased them away in that way. 
When the non-breezing seasons around, they often form flocks and they can be quite large numbers, up to a couple of hundred. Speaking of predators, the lapwings are very noisy and get very noisy at times, especially when breezing, breeding. They are usually the first one to detect humans, animals or any other intruders. At first they will start bobbing and calling from the ground, then fly up and make a lot of no dives over the intruder, all the way making loud calling noises. Those are that was three blacksmith plovers flying overhead. I don't know how they could time just so well just to show us their calls. Potential predators, they are the linear falcon or many other falcons, raptors, gulls, crows, coots, jackals, mongoose. Eggs and chicks are also threatened by floods and trampling by cattle or game. Blacksmith lapswings display several smart strategies when they're disturbed. They will rush at an intruder and utter their harsh clicking call while spreading their wings and holding their bodies horizontal with the neck extended and the bulls pointed towards the intruder. This will often repel the attack. They too leave the nest and rush to other spots and crouch down as so as to look as they are on a nest. Bold and brave parents of blacks with lapwings have been known to launch defect attacks on, would you believe it, African elephants. Great little birds those. Tenacious. It's very interesting to hear them communicating between each other. When it's the chicks on the ground, it's a little click, 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 telling them that we're here. It's okay. And of course, this can turn into the cling, 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 when there is a enemy around or there's some danger. Interestingly, prior to the 1900s, the blacksmith plover was very scarce in South Africa, south of the Orange River. It only occurred on KwaZulu-Natal coast in winter. First recorded Western Cape in the 1939 and breeding in 1947, uh, but now it's very abundant. The numbers have increased quite significantly over the past century because they're very adaptable. They settled in modified and agricultural environments, water waters and reservoirs and sewage plants. Consequently, they are now numerous and established in the Western Cape region of, of South Africa. Humans increase the potential habitat for these birds by building artificial walklands and water, fissure, water features, and by maintaining large lawns and sports fields all of which the blacksmith prover loves. I've seen them on the sports field at our school, at our church, and they're quite happy in the middle of the lawn there. That is because they can see what's coming from a long way off. They are partly migratory, so that if the rains stop coming and it becomes dry, they fly on to an area where there are more favourable habitats for them. I love watching them. They, like the crowned, plover, crowned lapwing, are tenacious and they protect the young with great enthusiasm and great gusto, particularly amongst the, along the waterholes in places like the Kruger Park or other parks like that. There you can see them in their natural habitat. Hope you enjoyed this. Lovely being here with you. Please subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Have a good day. Bye.